Hey guys, I'm Heather Nicole. Today we're going to talk about Lauren McCluskey. It's about a slaying of the University of Utah student Lauren McCluskey and the investigation that followed and this is the timeline. This is the picture of Lauren, a member of the University of Utah cross country and track and field team. McCluskey was shot and killed on campus October the 22nd by a man she briefly dated, Melvin Rowland, who also told her his name was Sean. She was found dead hours later inside a church. Here's the timeline events leading up to the October 22nd shooting death of the University of Utah student athlete Lauren McCluskey. And the weeks afterwards. So enjoy. September 2nd, 2018, Lauren McCluskey met Melvin Sean Rowland at London Bell, a Salt Lake City bar where he worked as a bouncer and began a relationship with him. He gave her a false name and age and didn't disclose that he was a convicted sex offender and was recently on parole. He visited her often at her residence hall and quickly built friendship with other students in the building. Later that month, she went pistol shooting with Roland and his friends, and as a felon, Roland was not allowed to possess a gun. September 26, McCluskey called two of her friends and said she was very sad. She said Roland would not let her hang out with her friends. The friends felt she didn't sound right and noticed that week that her physical appearance had begun to change. They believed she was being taken advantage of by Sean, also known as Roland. September 30th, Two of McCluskey's friends told staff at University of Utah dorms that they were scared about Roland's control over her and about how he talked about guns and stayed often in her room. That report and others to housing officials in days that followed were not passed to campus police. It wasn't even passed to campus behavioral team who may have intervened. Housing officials were aware that people knew McCluskey were specifically concerned that she could be hurt, but their focus remained on whether a housing policy violation was occurring according to conversations described in a later independent review. October the 9th, McCluskey learned Roland's real identity, including that he had lied about his age. He was actually 37 and not to close that he was a registered sex offender. In the first days of October, and briefly went, she briefly went home to Pullman, Washington. On October 9th, she invited Roland to her dorm, confronted him with the information, and broke off their relationship. He omitted his sex offender status, but denied the age difference. McCluskey allowed him to spend the night in her room, and borrowed her car the next day to run errands. She began receiving text messages, especially from Roland's friends. Some urged her to kill herself. October the 10th, Jill McCluskey, Lauren's mother, contacted campus dispatch, very upset and worried, to request a campus security escort to help Lauren retrieve her vehicle from Roland. The dispatcher contacted Lauren. She at first declined assistance, saying Roland was going to drop the vehicle off at her apartment, and she felt comfortable with him doing that. The dispatcher told Lauren she would have security officers near the building just in case. At 5 p.m., Lauren called back, saying the car was dropped off at the Rice Echo Stadium. It's in the parking lot. She needs a ride to pick it up. The security escort provided her a ride there to pick up her car. The review team noted that the university police did not learn 
until Lauren McCluskey's death about the car incident that she and her mother had felt that Lauren was in danger because the security escort was not entered into the record management system. The review team said the university should ensure security calls are recorded into a single system coordinated with police. October the 12th, Lauren McCluskey contacted university police reporting she had received suspicious messages she believed from Roland's friends. The text messages said Roland was dead and that it was her fault, but she found he had recently posted on social mis media disproving the claim. Such posts were a violation of Roland's parole terms, which prohibited him from using social media. Lauren told the reporting officer she did not feel in danger or threatened by the text, but his friends were trying to lure her out of her dorm for some reason. October 13th at 9.22 a.m., McCluskey again contacted University Police, reporting she had received more messages she believed was from Roland or his friends. The messages demanded money in exchange for not posting compromising photos of McCluskey and Roland online. McCluskey says she sent $1,000 to an account as demanded in hope of keeping the photos private. She spoke to an officer by phone and then in person, then by text, and eventually called the Salt Lake City Police Department. They referred her back to campus. Chief Bill Brophy said police took the report, pulled Roland's criminal history, but did not learn he was on parole. They assigned a detective to follow up later to possible charges of sexual extortion. One police knew of the extortion threat in the HN. The review team police should have found there was never an attempt by any of the officers involved to check Roland's offender status. Further, there were no policies or procedures that required such check. Brophy later said a formal extortion investigation case was open on October the 19th when a detective contacted McCluskey for more information, October the 19th through the 22nd. Security video shows Roland at various campus locations apparently seeking McCluskey, also looking through windows into her dorm. Over the weekend, McCluskey sends three screenshots, presumably to campus police, showing Roland's criminal history and his offender details. The day of the shooting, October 22nd, 10.39 a.m., McCluskey emailed police that she had not received another text from a spoof, that she had received another text message from a spoof number, sorry, claiming to be a deputy chief Rick McLennan, asking her to go to the police station. The only logical conclusion was that Roland sent it with the intent of getting McCluskey to leave her dorm. The reviewer's report said McCluskey was told not to respond to the text, but the fact that she had received the text was not reported to police administrators. October 22nd, 3 to 6 p.m., Roland waited for McCluskey with some of her friends in the residence hall. October 22nd, 8.20 p.m., Roland confronted McCluskey in the parking lot outside a residence hall. She was returning from a night class and on her phone with her mother. He grabbed her and she dropped her cell phone and belongings. He dragged her to the different spot in the lot, forcing her into the back seat. A car that he had driven to campus. Once she was in the car, Roland shot McCluskey multiple times. As a felon, Roland could not possess a gun. A man who had loaned the gun to him said Roland claimed he had a girlfriend and wanted to teach her how to shoot. October the 22nd, 8.23 p.m., Matt McCluskey, also known as Lauren's father, contacted dispatch. He relayed what Jill McCluskey heard on the phone and asked officers to respond. October the 22nd, 8.32 p.m., police went to the parking lot and found McCluskey's belongings. More police were mobilized. A search 
began of her dorm room, the parking lot, and the surrounding area. October the 22nd, 8.38 p.m. Roland called a woman he met on a dating site and asked her to pick him up. They went to dinner at a restaurant, drove by the state capitol, and went to her home downtown where he took a shower. She then dropped him off at a coffee shop. Later that night, she saw news reports about the shooting and recognized the photo of Roland immediately and called the police. October 22nd, 9.55 p.m. Before searching the parking lot, police found McCluskey's body in the back seat of a car. 9.56 p.m. A secure in place alert was sent to campus wide, telling the university community that there had been a shooting on campus. 10.09 p.m. An alert was sent with suspect was suspect for the suspect information. Updates were sent about every 30 minutes. October 22nd, 11.46 p.m. An alert lifting the secure in place order was sent after university police determined Roland had left campus. October 23rd, 12.01 a.m. An alert was sent identifying the suspect as his real name, Melvin Rowland. October 23rd, 1246 AM, Salt Lake City Police found Rowland and followed him on foot. He entered Trinity AME Church at 239 East Martin Luther King Boulevard, 600 South. As police entered the church, Rowland fatally shot himself. October 23rd, 1.47 a.m., an alert was sent saying Roland had been located and was no longer a threat. The day after the shooting, later on October 23rd, University Police Chief Dale Brophy told reporters that his office could not find Roland in the days before the shooting. He incorrectly said Roland had walked away from a halfway house, a statement that a university later corrected because he recently was staying in the dorm with Lauren. However, a Department of Corrections spokeswoman said officials knew where Roland was living. Parole off officials said university police did not inform them that McCluskey had accused Roland of harassing her, which could have led to his questioning by a parole agent or his arrest for a parole violation if proven his return to prison. October 24, the Department of Corrections revealed that parole agent was spoken to Roland on October 16th, unaware that four days earlier, McCluskey had begun calling university police to accuse him of harassing her. On October 25th, in an emotional press conference, Brophy revealed for the first time that Roland had extorted McCluskey on October 13th, threatening to release compromising photos of the two. If she didn't pay a thousand dollars, which she did, Brophy also revealed that Roland stopped McCluskey on campus for at least three days before killing her, and spent three hours before the shooting hanging out with her friends in the residence hall. Brophy also said Roland, after the shooting McCluskey, called another woman to pick him up, and they went to dinner and back to her place so he could shower. He said that the woman and the man, who had loaned Roland the gun contacted police and sent media reports about the slaying. The governor, in his monthly news conference, announced he had ordered an investigation, especially on the Utah Department of Corrections and the Board of Pardons and Parole. It announced this investigation for unlicensed activity. There was a diamond security group that hired Roland under the alias Sean Fields. As a bouncer at Salt Lake City, Salt Lake City restaurants, had a security contract with London Bell where Roland met McCluskey. 
Wallen had also worked as a bouncer inside Maxwell's East Coast Eatery. Black Diamond Security Group said on October the 25th that it had ended its relationship with Rowland about a month earlier. Within a few hours, DOPL issued a citation and a cease and desist order against Black Diamond saying the company was not licensed to provide security. Rowland had been hired under another name and the company did not run a background check. On that name, the Utah Department of Public Safety later found. More of Roland's violent past was uncovered, an attempted sexual assault of a teen girl in 2004. A 2012 parole hearing in which he admitted to raping the teen and two other women, and a 2016 admission that he had threatened that if an agent were to come conducted a field visit, he might become violent. October 22nd, University of Utah talked and arranged closed-door meeting of the competence of university police and administrators in the wake of McCluskey's death. October the 27th, two women who had briefly dated Roland earlier this year described to the Salt Lake Tribune his pattern of lies and manipulation, including falsehoods about his age and not disclosing his criminal record. October the 29th, released police records revealed Roland was suspected but never charged with burglarizing two women he dated in 2015. November the 2nd, Watkins changed course, announcing that the independent review she described in October the 25th news conference would look at actions taken by individual officers in the week before McCluskey was killed. The team included two former commissioners of the Utah Department of Public Safety, John Nielsen, who served in the post from 1985 through 1988, and also as an attorney, and Keith Squires, who returned as commissioner in August, former University of Wisconsin-Madison Police Chief Sue Risling was selected as the third member of the team. She is now executive director of the International Association of Campus Law Enforcement Administrators. November the 13th, Jill McCluskey, Lauren's mother, wrote in a tweet that the person who lent Lauren's killer the gun needs to be prosecuted. As a parolee, Roland was prohibited from possessing the gun, but Brophy said it's unlikely that the friend will face charges. Prosecutors said Utah's gun laws set a high bar. Evidence would have to prove that the gun owner intended to aid in the commission of crime of lending the firearm, or the owner knew it was illegal for a specific borrower to possess a gun. As we said earlier, he let him borrow the gun because he was teaching his girlfriend how to shoot. December the 19th, the Independent Review Team released its report Watkins said the report about the university police does not offer any reason to believe that McCluskey saying would have been prevented. Instead, the report offers weaknesses, identifies issues, and provides us with a roadmap for strengthening security on our campus. But Nielsen listed multiple significant missed opportunities, including the reports to housing officials by McCluskey's friends. In the days when the detectives assigned to McCluskey's case, was off and the work was not assigned to another officer. Among its recommendations, the review said the Campus Department of Public Safety is understaffed, that it needs to hire a victim advocate, and it needs to develop a coordinated working relationship with existing victim advocates. It needs to train all its officers about violence issues, and it needs to adopt an assessment already used by other Utah Police Departments in violence cases. Thank you for listening to me. I hope y'all have a great day. I hope you enjoyed. Thanks for listening. And thanks for watching. Goodbye.